Okay, I uh, want to welcome to the program Professor Elizabeth S Samet. She's a professor of English at West Point, author of Looking for the Good War, American Amnesia, and the Violent Pursuit of Happiness. And we should say the views of Elizabeth Samet expressed here do not reflect official policy or position of the Department of Army, the Department of Defense, or the U.S. government, which uh, apparently we've got to say because you're you're employed at West Point and... Um, Frankly, based upon the book, I'm not surprised. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, Professor, welcome to the program. I'm here with Emma Viglin. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here with you both. Yes, thank you. So let's start with, and, and I have to say, um, I cannot tell you, I, I don't think I ever contemplated that there would ever be a book that would come out that would um, take uh, Tom Brokaw and and Steven Spielberg to task for the the model and narrative that they have created over the years. I've always found it uh, problematic, and it's nice to to see it, it, it at least you know that supported it by, by academia. Um, but let's talk about the um, the the prevailing I guess myth that has been created around uh, World War II. And, and maybe we'll get into the to those six main elements of that myth. Sure. So, um, as you suggest, Spielberg and and uh, Brokaw and Stephen Ambrose, the architects of what we might call the 50th anniversary mythology of the war. And I think that's the most. There have been many myths of World War II, but I think that's the most powerful one. And um, the tenets that I suggest in the book are as follows, that the United States went to war to liberate the world from fascism and tyranny, which was, of course, a consequence of the war, but not necessarily the motivation for joining it, that all Americans were absolutely united in their commitment to the war effort. And that uh, tenet, I think, gained a lot of traction after subsequent wars, which did, which had nothing like the same consensus. Um, and so there was a certain nostalgia for an earlier war in which at least most people seemed to be in agreement. Um, the third is that everyone on the home front made tremendous sacrifices. The fourth, that Americans are liberators who fight decently and only when they must. <laughs> the fifth, uh, that World War II was a foreign tragedy with a happy American ending. And then the last, and these tenets are modeled on uh, George Orwell's maxims for the writer in his essay, Politics in the English Language, that everyone has always agreed on points one through five. Um, and I suggest that deep down, we know that these myths aren't necessarily true, but they have become uh, reflexive. And we invoke them all the time, especially when we confront all of the other wars that have followed in the wake of World War II. So let's let's I want to take each one and, and, and dig into them a little deeper um, and, and then but but let's start like when when did these did they all form simultaneously or I guess in um, did, did, they, did these myths all sort of like grow uh, concurrently, I guess, over the years uh, or were they sort of like sequentially deployed? I think that they grew by fits and starts. They, there isn't necessarily a sequence to them, um, but at certain points in our history, they were more prevalent than others. And as I said, they arose mostly later, although not all of them. Um, the first one, I would say, the idea of why we went to war began before we stopped fighting. So where one can see the transformation, uh, most we can see it in a lot of different places, but where you can see it very clearly is in some of the products the government made for uh, American service members. So these, they were these little guides, pocket guides to the various countries in which service members found themselves. And you can very clearly see uh, in the guide to Germany, for example, which has a section that uh, tells service members why they're fighting in Germany, um, which had to sort of combat some of the kind of natural allegiances, I think, that, that Americans felt, or at least they didn't feel that Germans were necessarily an enemy. And so these books sort of explained why. And they explained the roots of fascism. And they also recast America's role in the 30s, which is, of course, an isolationist one. 
but um, they recast it as this threat that America had recognized all along. And so then you begin to see uh, the way that it changes and we sort of backdate our participation. We backdate our interest in world affairs and we backdate our recognition of the very real dangers of fascism, which were that that recognition came quite late, I think. And part of that is like, I would imagine fits quite well into the erasure of Soviet Union participation in the fight, right? Where there is very little understanding, I think domestically about how many millions of Soviet soldiers died in the in World War II. And I mean, I would imagine that part of that rewriting of history fits in well with the Cold War that that begins after the war. I think the role of the, the Russians, the role of the Soviet Union was extremely difficult, especially to explain to uh, American service members. So first, the, the Soviet Union was allied with Germany, then allied with us. And then after the war and the Cold War, the enemy again. And so I think that that became a particularly difficult, thorny problem. And uh, this parts of this myth did succeed in, in erasing that as well. What's fascinating is the idea that they have to hand out pamphlets as to why you're fighting here uh, sort of undercuts the idea that everybody understood why they were fighting there. And I think it's unrealistic to expect that everyone in an army understands all of the philosophical or political commitments animating any conflict. Um, many are, are concerned quite rightly with short-term survival. But it was certainly true that what's, uh, for the French, um, which tried to explain why the French were our allies and tried to overcome a kind of natural distaste, it would appear, um, between the, uh, the Americans and the, and the French, expressing, uh, explaining the role of Lafayette, explaining the uh, role of the French in the, in the American Revolution, and that the French were like us lovers of liberty it was something that these books, um, particularly as the, um, toward the end of the war and afterwards, as we sort of occupied France and, and um, became increasingly um, the, the tensions between Americans and French, as has been documented by many historians, became increase, increasingly intense. Um, we're we're going to talk, obviously, more about this, and I, and I want to keep going through this, this list. Um, but it, it seems to me that these myths are propagated by the U.S. government, and then there are uh, entities in our society that find it, you know, for whatever reason, um, that like it, it's just much easier uh, to to ride these myths that have already been initiated. I mean, the myths are, are established, right, by the U.S. government uh, to get the military, to get people in the military to do their job. And I, I mean, I'm struck by the idea of like how it's almost the opposite of what happened in the context of Iraq. And it may be the opposite in other uh, military interventions, but this one, I was, you know, an adult. Like, we knew why we were going into Iraq, even though, I mean, uh, you know, supposedly on day one, which was, we got to fight them over there before we fight them over here, and we don't want the um, the 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 um, the the firing gun or whatever it is to be a smokestack, you know, a a a, a, a nuclear, you know, mushroom cloud, and then all of that seemed to unravel as we got there, which is sort of the opposite, it feels like, in terms of, of World War II. Um, and, but, but, but let's head to, to, to number two, that we were all united uh, in, this, uh, in, this, in this fight. Well, I would say that this number two, uh, and really the entire myth, you, you said that, that they're propagated by the government. I, I think myth works in slightly more mysterious ways than that, um, and in some kinds of insidious ways. Um, so I don't think they're all sort of part of an official propaganda campaign. I think they are certainly encouraged. Um, the rhetoric of that war was used to justify later wars, I think, certainly. Um, but I, I think that uh, this tenon as well, in the terms of being people being absolutely united, um, arose in the wake of wars in which Americans were emphatically not united. So Vietnam, perhaps the most obvious case. Um, but I think that a lot, of, a lot of the discussion of everyone being welcomed home with open arms became a sort of nostalgic glance for Americans um, who did not necessarily welcome Vietnam veterans home. 
um, and did not embrace them and confused perhaps the war with the with those who fought it, um, which is something I think we've tried to atone for yet again uh, in these conflicts. But I do think that if you look at the films and the books of the time and you look at the newspapers of the time and other documentation, you'll see that uh, those soldiers, there were so many of them, you know, millions returning, um, were a source of great anxiety rather than people we welcomed home uh, with great enthusiasm. Although, of course, I think the enthusiasm was certainly greater than in later wars. But didn't like I guess what I'm saying about the 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 government propaganda like I I you know uh, I, I can just Google you know United World War II and I'm imagining that we're, we would have I don't know how many posters that would say you know we're united and that you know the um, the government generates these I guess memes for lack of a better term. I don't think that's what they would call them at that time. Um, and they're picked up because they maybe, I don't know, follow some uh, romanticized version and they become easier for, for you know, Spielberg, we'll, we'll get into Spielberg a little bit in, in, in a bit, but I mean, he, you know, he, he liked big ideas like that. After he, his first movie bombed, everything after that was going to be sort of broad and accessible. And what's more accessible than essentially, you know, getting a theme from a war poster? And I think, well, I, I think cries for unity, for rallying around various symbols and ideas is, is part and parcel of any nation going to war. Absolutely. Um, I do think also that in the case of this war, and this is part of the power of the myth, it offers us the most flattering version of ourselves. That's why it's so seductive. That's why I think it makes such good movies. Um, and that's why I think the, the mythology of the, of the 50th anniversary celebrations of the war were so powerful. Um, and, and part of my point is that um, it, it celebrating the war in the way we do, I think condemns us to, uh, looking backwards uh, rather than forwards. And we keep sort of searching for a war that will have the same kinds of effects, the same kinds of consequences. Let's talk about number three, the home front sacrifices. That feels like, um, you know, us trying to sort of make us feel like, well, yeah, the British had to go underground because of bombings in Germany. Well, they we we firebombed a lot of cities, and the Russians lost millions of lives. But we, we, people had to go into factories here. I mean, <laughs> there there sort of feels like there's a little bit of insecurity involved in that one too. Well, we of course have had the great good fortune of not having a war on our home soil since the Civil War. And so there is certainly a sense in which, you know, when we look at the sacrifices of the British, as you suggest, are seem to pale in comparison. In many ways, uh, the war, of course, brought America back to work. People made and, and had more money than they'd ever had in their lives. Uh, and so that feeling of prosperity coexisted, I think, uneasily with uh, Set with the idea of sacrifice. There were, of course, official sacrifices of rationing and other things, but I don't think that everyone sacrificed to the degree um, that we remember it as, as we do now. And um, that we were going to be uh, treated as liberators. Um, the, w w tell us about uh, the, of that one. So, I think one of the, the great consequences of World War II was, of course, the liberation of, of Europe from the tyrannies of fascism. Um, and I think that that's you know, not up for debate. This is not an argument. My book is not an argument that our participation was either unnecessary or unjustified. I, I think it was belated. Um, and I think it was not for the reasons that we later attributed it necessarily. But we did undeniably uh, achieve that uh, liberation in Europe. And as I said, that gave us, I think, the most flattering view of ourselves. And yet the consequence of that it subsequently seemed to have given to our ideas of American violence a kind of exceptionalism, that whenever employed elsewhere in the world, unlike the military force of other nations, it would inevitably lead to a similar conclusion. And of course, we've seen the many ways in which that has not played out. But the rhetoric of liberation um, uh, is always, almost always employed uh, when we do decide to use military force around the world. Um, 
Well, that's like, I mean, that's a, when you said, just to quickly interject, the we will be greeted as liberators kind of concept, that is a directly copy and pasted into the Iraq War, the most, you know, consequential conflict that we've engaged in uh, since, I mean, maybe not since Vietnam, right? Right, and we seem to be, have this perpetual capacity for being surprised um, when we're not greeted as liberators. Right. And that too owes owes to the World War II mythology. Um, this notion of uh, foreign tragedy, but but a happy end, that is a, a, an American one. I mean, this that seems also sort of built into this notion of trying to that when we engage in a war, it is sort of fundamentally different than when other countries engage in a war. I think that, yes, that that too is part of our exceptionalist idea, which of course far predates World War II, but gathered a lot of momentum from it. Um, and it, you know, it's Reinhold Niebuhr who, after the war and the irony of American history, uh, suggested that, that Americans sort of thought of, of tragedy as a kind of European problem, um, that, it was, that it was something not associated with them. And I think we do have a, a kind of reluctance um, to, to view the world as anything but comic in that richer sense, not, not the, the humor sense, but in that, that sense of having happy endings. Um, and so we want to put them on all of our stories and that does not always work out. Um, let, I mean, let's, let's talk about how, like where, and then, uh, then that, that everyone agrees with one and si one through six. I mean, how does that, how did that play out? I mean, I, when I, when I think of that, I just think of like, I don't know, like that guy Meacham and uh, Tom Brokaw sitting around and, you know, uh, maybe even Brian Williams uh, trying to get in on that a little bit of just talking about the greatest generation. And I don't know, we just saw it with Bob Dole. Like um, it, it was as if nothing happened in his, his whatever it was, 60 year long career as a politician. And we're still talking about him from World War II. It's... Uh... I think it is intensified in this period as well by the fact that the numbers of World War II veterans are dwindling and dwindling quickly. Um, and I think that, that that's often in the news. Um, and I think that that makes this intense identification with this earlier time even more urgent. But it is true, it seems as if um, that singular event uh, eclipses the rest of, of someone's career in, in moments like that. I mean, but let's talk about like where, how, you know, what it is, the, the, where, where this myth grew, I guess, because it was it was it growing, you know, when we talk about uh, Spielberg or we talk about Tom Brokaw, we're, we're, we're I guess it, we're talking about it almost like a, in the fiftieth anniversary uh, of the war. Like, what happened in the interim, and is this, and and I guess how much of it is also a function of like the baby boomers. Because so much of our culture, it seems to me, is dictated by baby boomers, and it's their parents, right? Like there, it's almost like there's some measure of stolen valor, or or just sort of trying to put their parents on a pedestal. Well, I think that a, a concatenation of different events worked to galvanize the the, the 50th anniversary mythology. So. You had not only what um, would come to be called the Vietnam hangover or the Vietnam syndrome, um, you also had the first Gulf War, which was nearly contemporaneous. And I think that certainly uh, the first President Bush's own history as a World War II veteran played into his role as the commander in chief during the first Gulf War. And he clearly viewed that war as being able to, as he called it, to kick the Vietnam syndrome once and for all. So the, I think there was clearly a sense in which um, those things worked in harmony with the 50th anniversary celebrations and this cultivation, the, the coinage of this term, the greatest generation, um, as a way for a country whose confidence, I think, had been shaken by Vietnam um, to regain gain a kind of earlier luster through this mythology. Um, let's talk specifically about some of those people. Like, how did Brokaw, for people who don't know, I mean, I because I, I, I grew up in, you know, I, I was, 
too conscious in the 90s. And so, uh, and I remember just being so angry at the, the Saving Private Ryan movie. I was just, I just, I got so annoyed by all of it. Um, but will you like walk us through sort of like, you know, their, their role? I mean, they were all like on some type of 50th anniversary committee, it feels like. I mean, like literally. So, so Ambrose really launched this, I think, with his several books. Um, Stephen. And, yes, Stephen Ambrose, the historian, uh, launched it with several books. And he was very open in his interviews about those books, that he grew up idolizing those who fought in World War II. Um, and uh, they were heroes. They were giants to him. And um, I, I think he wrote those histories in that way. There was a boyish hero worship that infused them all. Um, his great gift was for these wonderful stories, right? They, those histories have great narrative um, and they focus on individuals. Uh, they very carefully, Band of Brothers focuses on an elite unit. And so they're very seductive as stories. They often abstract battlefield heroics from the larger question of causes. Causes are sort of assumed. Um, he has to do something with the fact that that generation didn't talk a lot about causes. So he just attributes their that to a kind of stoicism. Um, so there's just an absence of that kind of talk, but he has to supply it. Um, and then picking up from there, uh, Tom Brokaw's book, The Greatest Generation, and he clearly uh, acknowledges his debt to Ambrose's telling of, of the World War II story, um, gave another name. In addition to the good war, we now had The Greatest Generation. And um, the movie Saving Private Ryan, uh, which you've also uh, brought up, I think, of course, was extremely influential, still is uh, among people uh, who think about uh, military service, I think, as was the series Band of Brothers, um, which came uh, later. But I think there, too, this idea that you would abstract a very uh, small story um, and a story that is sort of wildly ahistorical in its celebration of uh, going to find one private, as if that's the most important thing in a war that was, of course, uh, was mass mobilization and had, sadly, no luxury for that. It, it makes it feel almost like an old-fashioned epic in which one soldier is battling, out, battling it out against another. And it, it doesn't look like the World War II movies uh, that were closer to the period. One that I mention in my book is um, 12 O'Clock High, which is the movie about a, an Air Force unit. And the emphasis throughout there is that you can't afford, it's the unit that matters. You can't afford to uh, make exceptions for one person. Um, the, the stakes are too high. And uh, so the, the individual personality is submerged um, in that war. And uh, I think that that, you know, many of the memoirists of the, of the period or later um, and others uh, recognized that, that this was not a war about individuals. And so it's a very strange thing to make it one. Well, you assign it this like emotional res like meaning that can, I guess, buoy the story artificially or the hagiography or whatever you want to, or, I mean, I guess maybe the, the mythologizing of the war, because you make it this uh personal and moral individual i guess mission as opposed to reflecting the the true brutality and complex reality right and and a lot of the soldiers in the middle of saving private ryan aren't so happy about this mission but what happens the sum total of the, the cumulative effect of the movie that that all of that dissent seems to be washed out by the the frame story which is of course the older Private Ryan, who comes, he's an old man, he comes to the cemetery um, in Normandy and uh, he visits those who died to save him. And so it's very emotional, very sentimental, and it washes out all of those questions that really are raised even by uh, Captain Miller, the, the head of the, uh, the, the commander of the, the company that has to go save him. I, I, I also found there was a sort of subsidiary theme in that movie that I felt was sort of deployed to address any of the questions of like, hey, should we have dropped both those nuclear weapons or should we have firebombed Dresden? Um, and that was, you can't let one German escape 
You can't, you cannot have a shred of mercy or it will come back to get you in the form of the prisoner they captured and let go, who came back and shot one of the guys or something. Mm. Like it was just, and it, I mean, it was sort of the secondary theme and it was sort of submerged in there, but it was basically like, it was, you know, it, it was number six of your list. Like we, we, we've all got to be on the same page here. What we're doing is completely righteous and in both in a, moral and in a sort of like a practical material way. And I think it's focus, you know, you, you mentioned the atomic bombs, um, you know, it's fo these stories are for the most part uh, in the European theater. And I think that's for a reason because it's a lot harder to wrestle with uh, the Pacific theater. And so I, I think it's focus on that um, is, is designed not to have to deal with any of those other issues. Um, and also the, yeah, that, that idea of, of showing mercy and then, having that come back to haunt you, which is a, a frequent uh, motif, I think, that you see in war movies, um, but but not only of World War II, um, but certainly is one of the running themes of that film. Um, is this, because I want to talk a little bit about what was taking place in the in, in, the, in the 50s, because this, you, I mean, you write about the, the noir movement in film, and, and very often it involved a, a vet from World War II in it, um, which I, which, it is fascinating because it's sort of like an allusion to the fact that like, look, this is dark stuff. There is like some dark stuff happening underneath the surface here. Um, that is a function of, you know, people get just really sort of shattered in, in, in war and they come back and they don't, you don't necessarily see it on the surface, but does the, and I want you to talk about that, but also I guess like, is this crew of the 50th anniversary folks, uh, Ambrose and Brokaw and, Tom Hanks and Spielberg and are they sort of like our, our version of the Dunning school in terms of like, like, um, you know, for whatever purpose, creating this myth that we supposedly need at this time or whatever it was, um, or for whatever reason that, 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 that now, you know, hopefully in, Maybe you are a part of that response. Uh, to, you know, I, I'm wondering just like if there's a parallel there and what's going on with this country that we need to do this. So I think in one important sense, there's not a parallel. I think the Dunning School was animated by, uh, clearly animated by racism, by white supremacy, by a desire to unmake history in its, its celebration of the, of the lost cause and in its uh, dismantling of, a, of a, an understanding of reconstruction um, that had existed before. So I, I think in that way, it's very different. I don't attribute the same sinister motives to those who mythologize World War II. But there is a similarity in the way the wars have been mythologized in that I do think that they, that myths born of whatever reason, uh, with whatever good intentions, even if in this case, it's a kind of uncomplicated veneration of ancestors as you attributed to the, to the baby boomer generation, possibly, that, they, that these myths always have a double edge. And that in this case, um, the myth of World War II has, I think, licensed in many ways, subsequent uses of American force. And to the extent that we are emerging from the damage done by civil war lost cause mythology, and I think we are slowly anyway, um, that can serve as a kind of parallel as we think about what will be the long-term damage of, of World War II mythology. Um, and I think we're at a moment now, I mean, if you think about it, World War II is only half as old as the civil war, and it's not sort of sealed off in the past quite yet. And so maybe there is still an opportunity, at least that's my hope, um, that we can think about it anew and that that might also help us exert more rational restraint in the future application of military force. I uh, talk about that, that, that noir period a little bit, but I'm also, as you were saying that, I was also reminded that um, I guess in the wake of World War II or maybe in the run up, like we started to name some of our bases and, and, and the, the naming using Southern general, you know, Confederate generals sort of came into fashion, but I imagine that was just sort of a way of like, we want to make as many people as comfortable as possible in our military, uh, unless of course they're not white. Uh, I mean, during World War II, right? I mean, that was. 
Yeah, so the, the naming conventions really date back to World War I. Um, and of course, you know, the 50th uh, anniversary celebrations of, of the Civil War occurred during the administration of Woodrow Wilson, um, whose racism is now, I think, finally coming, certainly has come to light. Um, and uh, I think that uh, he, he went a long way toward accelerating these practices and to making it, I think, a, you know, he segregated the federal workforce. Um, he certainly made it a lot easier for regional uh, lost cause movements to have a kind of national foothold. And so the naming of bases for Confederates, um, and of course, many of those bases are located in the South, and they were made in coordination and conversation with, with uh, local officials. And so it certainly was a desire, I think, to make people feel comfortable with those bases there. Um, and so that practice gained, uh, or continued in World War II. And some of those were old, smaller forts that were uh, enlarged, and then there were others that were, that were new. Um, some of them have fortunately not survived. I mean, we're still reckoning with 10 forts um, that have Confederate names, but there were others arguably even more outrageous, like one named for Nathan Bedford Forrest, um, mm. which did not survive the war, or which was decommissioned uh, soon after. Uh, I'm sorry, I keep I keep to re referencing right. film noir and then asking you another question. So you can't. But but I mean, talk about that dynamic. Like, what was going on with that there the, during that that era? So film noir, among other genres, frequently featured uh, the returning veteran. Of course, that was just uh, often a function of numbers, right? There were so many that they were uh, a common feature of everyday life. It was not. Um, exceptional to to make a movie about with a veteran in it um, and. So many of these noir and, and other films as well, other genres, drama, comedies, were focused or at least had tangentially in, in some cases, this figure of the veteran whose life, who returned to a life that was not the one, usually a he, that he had left. Um, and that's inherited from some World War I movies where you see the same thing. They've gone away, they're expected to resume their lives, but they can't. Um, it's fueled by a certain animosity by the civilians at home who say, you must just want my job, um, who don't really, who want veterans to just get back to normal and to get over it. Um, these veterans are also figures of suspicion. Um, one sort of common plot shared by several films is the veteran as drifter who comes into town and often his arrival in town coincides with the crime. The crime is usually perpetrated by a banker or by someone respectable in town. But of course, this drifter, this veteran is often accused of it. And the interesting thing to me, or one of the most interesting things to me, is that the veteran service record often plays a role in these films. So a detective or a district attorney will call up, call to Washington for the service record and find that this veteran had an outstanding record, um, often a silver star, a purple heart, um, some, and, and a, certainly a distinguished record. And then that record is, is sort of has a double edge to it. So sometimes it's used to say, well, someone with a record like this who served in the war so um, honorably, how could this person be guilty of a crime? On the other hand, here's someone who's used to dealing with, prob dealing with problems through violent means, solving problems through violence. And so it also, it at the same time, makes the veteran more suspect. Um, and so this becomes a, a, he's a polarizing figure. He also becomes a, a figure that people would rather not look at because they, they remind him of unpleasant times and of instability. Was that, was that a reflection of like a little bit more of a sort of unmythified or unvarnished look at, I mean, was that a way of expressing the sort of at least ambiguity of, of the experience of war that somehow just we ended up getting rid of because we needed the, the sort of the more sanitized version as we moved on as a country? Yes. And, and I think that's, so that's the important part of the, of the sixth, the sixth tenet of the myth is that the, the idea that everybody agree, has always agreed with this with these, this, this hagiography. And of course they haven't. And I think that you can see that in films, you can see it in novels, um, you can see it in the history of the period. Um, and I think that uh, you can also, there's another fabulous place to look for this kind of ambivalence and to look for the fact that nobody really agreed with all of these things 
been told much later, and that's uh, Studs Terkel's The Good War, uh, which was a product of the 80s, so around the 40th anniversary um, of the war. And Terkel, as you know, this was his great genius, right, was assembling all of these uh, collections, these, these interviews, and they don't make sense. They don't give you uh, this was the way it was. They instead give you this just many different voices, many different perspectives, all colliding and contradicting one another. Uh, sometimes even one person's testimony contradicts itself. But throughout that seems to me to be a, ver a, a much more um, positive, a much more, frankly, American way of, of remembrance, um, of remembering war, um, of remembering the, the very different uh, elements of the legacy. So I guess, lastly, I mean, do we, for this, I mean, and this, I, I feel like the, the greatest generation has been sort of, you know, weaponized in, in so many different ways in our society. And, you know, we talked about it in the context of in the run up to the Iraq war. I imagine it also um, functions as a, in, in, in a really, um, a difficult way for vets of of the Iraq War, of Vietnam, of the Korean War. I mean, you're not the greatest generation, you know. Like, I mean, that's you know, despite the fact that you more than likely went through um, uh, just as uh, similar type of horrors and maybe had to do horrible things. Uh, but you're not the greatest generation. You're you're substandard on some level. It, uh, are we? Do we need to wait until a generation or two passes before this there can be a, a full reckoning and a corrective of this? I mean, I would imagine at one point vets of later's wars would be like, you know, that's this is that myth of, I don't know, our older brother or whatever it was, like w is not helpful for us in addition to being thoroughly untrue and not helpful as a, as a country in terms of like deciding where we go next. I think with the with the particular connection to soldiers today and how we does that does that idea of the greatest generation complicate how we deal with soldiers today probably because it suggests that um, in this earlier war it was a lot um, I don't know a lot less complicated right to mythologize the soldier or to think of the soldier as doing great things um, these wars have been. Uh, nothing like that clear to us. We also, however, respond to soldiers today with a very strange kind of, um, I don't know, an enthusiasm followed by uh, a sense of relief that we don't have to deal with them anymore. Um, the thank you for your service motif is one of those things for me that it, it, people feel they need to atone for Vietnam, but they also don't want to spend too much time thinking about what soldiers do. Um, and so then they move on. Um, and I think that's sort of been our our response to to this war. We were encouraged not to pay too much attention to it, right? The old go shopping idea um, to these wars. But, but no, on the other hand, no images of of returning caskets, et cetera. Et cetera. Well, um, it's uh, it's fascinating. the um, uh, The book is the uh, Good War: American Amnesia and the Violent Pursuit of Happiness. Elizabeth uh, Samet, we will put a uh, link to that at uh, majority.fm. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I enjoyed joining you.